County Cavan and Far Fermanagh. On the map, a filigree pattern of lake and water meadow hooked on at the west to the lonely Quilkia Mountains. Memories of marchings and manoeuvres of own row and the tragic end to his story. And in relation to the present day, the Robinson brothers at Milltown near Belturbet and the delicate art or craft they practice. The word filigree is as apt as any other. The three brothers are Charles, Michael and Tom Joe. And with them their cousin Ignatius Foster, an apprentice to, or you might more readily say, student of the craft of marketry. It takes a man five to seven years to learn the skills that go to the making of traditional or classical furniture. The Robinsons are craftsmen who don't waste much time on idle talk. They go at their work with a quiet determination that still does not conceal their respect and love for the raw material they use. It all begins here with planks of rare and valuable wood. Mahogany, as Charles Robinson says, from the new world. What they will do as we watch them is to make a suite of dining room furniture the sideboard accepted, in a style that we associate with the grandeur of the period of the late King's George, the Regency. The brothers, you might say, give constant thought to their chosen, even hereditary crown. Cycling home one evening, Michael struck on an idea for turning all the chair backs together, doing several in one skillful move. And like a devoted musician who has discovered a new melody, he couldn't even wait until the next morning to test and try it out. The wood is polished with a handful of shavings. This working in wood calls for patience and practice. And there's a lot more than that to it when it comes to these high levels of craftsmanship. For the expert knows that no two trees, even of the same species, are ever identical. That the life story of a tree, happiness and unhappiness you might say, are written in its substance. With hand and dividers the carving is measured on the chair rack and carefully drawn in. James Robinson, the great-grandfather and his son William of Drumgoon House near Kilishandra, went in for coopering in a big way. Four journeymen coopers and five of themselves constantly at work. The Robinsons remember their father steeping hazel rods in the brook for hoops or bands for the butter firkins, to get the product from the farms to the butter markets, then to be found in every town. But about the beginning of the century, round about the time when the Kilishandra Creamery was established and the cooperative movement underway, the firkin and the coopering began to disappear and the old style butter market. Now it's back to the lid. This time Michael is turning the center pillar of the tripod leg, which will support the table.
and a final check before sanding. When Charles Robinson here walks down the stairs carrying these sheets of mahogany and sycamore veneer, he knows that he is carrying material that has been tried and tested. He must make a veneer sandwich of alternate layers of pale and dark wood, cutting them up in pairs until he has a total of 12. The dictionary tells us that a veneer is a thin layer of wood, ivory tortoise shell with a decorative or fine finish that is bonded to the surface of a less expensive material, usually wood. Animal or scotch glue is used to stick the layers of veneer together. In the mid-1940s, Charles left school and apprenticed in a local furniture factory in Bell Turbot which later closed. He speaks highly of Ernie Cregan who worked there, a skilled cabinet maker who had learned his craft in Dublin. The hot Ignatius Foster brings the hot coals of plywood, blocks that are clamped together on each side of the veneer sandwich. A sheet of newspaper prevents the glue from sticking to the cores. They are firmly clamped together at each end and will be left for at least 12 hours to set. Carefully and skillfully, Charles draws in the traditional design. The paper folded in two so that the imprint, the mirror image, can be traced in. Later, the saw will faithfully follow the graceful lines of the master copy. But before that, it must be laid on and glued firmly to the veneer sandwich. Charles rubs beeswax onto the swarf or backing piece and smooths it with the hot iron. That backing piece is of walnut, cut with the grain at right angles or opposite to the veneer above. The beeswax lubricates the saw. The keeping of bees, as we shall see, is an important part of the Robinson household. The islands in the plan are pierced to allow the fret saw blade to enter. Jobs were hard to get in the 1950s. Once the brothers felt good if they could see themselves employed for three weeks ahead. Now they have a two-year waiting list. Michael carefully applies glue to the dovetail joint of one of the legs which will form the tripod and help support the table. Once Rewards were so low in the early 60s, even for the making of upholstered chairs in Ash and Beach, that you felt like giving up, or you eked out by restoring furniture or polishing church seating. Now interested customers come from all over. It's a good way to be, and hopefully, a good sign of the times. And children coming home from school look in at the window. The children are interested, and the Robinson brothers want them to be interested, even if the skills of marquetry, veneering and inlay have been by long tradition carefully kept secret.
Charles deftly slips the delicate fret saw blade through one of the islands in the veneer sandwich. The first fret saw blades were made in northern Italy in 1562. They were cut from clock spring steel and mounted on wooden bow frames. The blade is now tensioned like a violinist tuning his instrument to the correct pitch. Tom Joe made the swing saw, as it is called, an improved version of the marketway donkey. Made it eight years ago from a design he found in an old Victorian book. The bellows blows away the sawdust from the point of contact, giving a clear view of the cutting line. The magnifying glass helps at a tricky corner. difficult one to maneuver out of. You've got to keep the pressure on the saw, keep it moving, then spin, swing right round. Very often. Now this is a, a complete roundabout turn. The art of marquetry is very ancient indeed. The Egyptians were skilled in the use of veneers and examples of their marquetry have survived to this day in our caskets. And later monks in northern Italy kept the craft alive during the Dark Ages. And it was to reach a high point in France in the 18th century by craftsmen originally encouraged at the court of Louis XIV, the Sun King. A man in C. Muldoon once said that C. Muldoon was a land of milk and honey if you milked your own cows and kept your own bees. Charles Robinson is an excellent beekeeper. The wax from the comb from these hives makes polish for the wood. The honey is naturally eaten or sipped, whatever you do with honey. No good morning. Very good, very, very good. There was always an air of great secrecy surrounding the various techniques employed in marquetry. But in a world in which craftsmanship is not so common, the Robinsons see no reason for hiding their unique talent, least of all from the young. The cut marquetry is placed in a tub of water to soak for 24 hours. Now the leaves can be carefully separated and the contrasts swapped. Pale sycamore and dark mahogany. It would seem to be perfectly understandable why it takes seven years apprenticeship to this craft to become a true master. The apprenticeship rules were even more stringent in France in 1743 when the Paris Guild of Master Carpenters and Cabinet Makers admitted marketeers for the first time. Apprentices had to serve a seven-year apprenticeship 
then a further seven years as a journeyman marketeer before being allowed to make their masterpiece for submission to the jury where it faced approval or confiscation. Gummed paper is placed over the individual leaves to hold the veneers in place until they are required. Impact adhesive is applied to the back of the marquetry and to the chair back and allowed to become tacky. The motif or lay on, as it is called, is carefully positioned on the chair back. The veneer hammer is a special marketeer's tool for rolling the veneer to get the best possible contact. In times gone by when animal glue was used for this task, a sock of hot sand was placed on the work to maintain pressure when it dried, but modern impact adhesives have speeded up this process. Contrary to what one would expect, the motif is not recessed into the chair bag. It is an optical illusion created by this all-important groove which frames the work. But as we shall see, recessed inlay does play its part. Now comes the sanding with fine grades of sandpaper. It is very easy to overdo the decoration, be it a picture, a Christmas cake, or marquetry on a piece of furniture. The marquetry should never be allowed to dominate the overall design, only enhance it. The carefully examining eye of the craftsman. Sand shading, or in this case, Hot carborundum powder is used to scorch the wood to get a graduated shading effect. The motif, a wild woodbine flower. A shell design. A graceful Grecian urn. On furniture, these motifs are described as applied marketing, but in a panel as pictorial marketing, and each individual piece has been cut out using a knife. And to bring us back to a sense of history, Lahuther Castle and the lake around it. Tom Joe steps out to visit John P. Riley's farm in search of spindle wood, one of many traditional saw cut cabinet woods used by marketry craftsmen. Hello, John P. Tom Joe. How are How you? Are you? Oh, very good, no? Thanks. Lovely day, isn't it? Oh, it is lovely. Yeah, it is I'm good. looking for another piece of spindle wood. Oh, yes. Do you have a piece? Oh, yes, I have. A... Another piece that I cut there at Christmas, like in Liberty, and in fact I have a tree growing here, have Tom you? Joe, up the, here in the field. Yes, really. This is here. That's a fine specimen, John P. Oh yes, it is indeed. Great one. That must be old. It's old all right, Tom Joe. I'd nearly be afraid, ashamed to tell you when I used to have it first. I could cut the bit of it uh, well, when the leaves fall off it. Well, here's the piece I've got for you now, Tom Joe. Oh, that's good. Yeah, you can have it. Maybe you'd be fit to make some use of it. Oh, sure. Oh, thanks. thanks very much. Michael cuts the groove for the inlay into the tabletop, the recess groove. The sawing of the fine strips of spindle wood is called springing. The fine strips are drawn through a die to make them smooth and square and uniform. Have I not cut 
here. I have you about six lanes. Seven. Oh, then it'll be enough. Well, they're pretty good. They're pretty good. A little girl that sparks. The glue is carefully poured into the recess. The stringing inserted. and rolled home with a hot, wet roller. The comfort and security of the chair you sit on depends a lot on this gluing and pinning. The dowels, those little promontories of wood, must be set in exactly at the right angle to knit with the containing wood. And afterwards, the glue that spills over around the joint must be carefully wiped away with a wet cloth so that it won't mar the polishing process. It is this care to details, this painstaking groundwork, that makes for the perfect glimmering finish. And we will see how perfect that finish will be. Now the chair is carefully clamped together to make assurance doubly sure for the pins. As Charles Robinson says, it goes together very sweetly. The Robinsons screen print their own billheads, a process adopted for their own use by Tom Joe. Tom Joe you could describe as the bursar of the Robinson community. He runs the house, but is also, like his brothers, an excellent craftsman, and in his spare time, when he has any, makes grandfather clocks. Ignatius sprinkles on the powder, which, when toasted under the grill, causes the lettering to rise. And this is the perfected billhead, as good, you might say, as the family flag. Now the completed furniture is on the move, up and up, to the polishing shed to get that all-important finish. A bichromate of potash stain, light sensitive, is used to darken the wood. After only a few minutes, its magic is working. Up to seven coats of button French polish are brushed on, half an hour between coats and a sanding down each time. Another sanding, but only after the French polish has been allowed to cure for a week. Then a mixture of carnauba, beeswax and turpentine, and a lot of hand rubbing. And strangely enough, a final polish with fine steel wool, always rubbed lightly with the grain.
Beeswax rubbed on a screw makes for easier driving and a better hold. And as the pieces come together in their final finished state, table leaf to table, chair by chair, transformed from rough plank to gleaming polished wood, the Robinsons gather around to inspect their work, their finished work. They don't need to comment in words. The product of their labor and skill speaks for itself, and the very air is eloquent. <laughs>